This video presentation reviews the life of Imam Hassan al-Askari alayhi salam and provides an overview of the oppression and the hardship that he endured during his imamat. This video also highlights the imam's efforts to prepare the Shias for the occultation of his son, Imam Mahdi. Imam Hassan ibn Ali alayhi salam, also known as Askari, was born on the 8th of Rabi'ul Thani in the year 232 Hijri in Medina. Similar to the second Shia Imam, Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba, Imam Askari was also given the title of Abba Muhammad. He was also known by the title of Ibn al-Raza, or the son of Raza, as he was from the lineage of Imam Raza alayhi salam. Imam Raza had become very well known amongst the Muslims after becoming the crown prince of Ma'mun, and thus the next Shia Imams from his lineage were known as Ibn al Raza. Imam Askari's mother was a slave before she married Imam Hadi. She is referred to by various names, including Hudayf, Salil, and Sausan. It was the Ahlul Bayt's family tradition to attribute multiple honorable names to their slave wives to remove the bad memories from their periods of captivity. Imam Askari's mother was so pious that Imam Hadi had described her as the one who was away from any impurity and evil. Imam Askari was about two years old when Mutawakil forcefully relocated Imam Hadi and his family to Samarra. Imam Askari left Medina forever and did not ever have an opportunity to return to Medina or Mecca. As a result, Imam Askari is the only Shia Imam who did not perform the Hajj. Similar to his father, Imam Hadi, Imam Askari was given the title of Askari, which means the army. This title referred to the Imam's residence in the city of Samra, which was originally built to accommodate Mu'tasim's Turkish army. Askari also referred to the name of the city's neighborhood, where the Imam was living in which was within army bases and government offices. Therefore, the Imam's activities during his Imamat were intensely monitored by the government, and his interactions with his representatives and the people were significantly limited. There are limited historical records about the life of Imam Askari before his imamat. The available records suggest that many had never seen the imam before his imamat. This was to such an extent that some saw Imam Askari's face for the first time during the memorial program for the demise of his brother, Sayyid Muhammad, when the imam was 20 years old. The imam had limited public interactions due to the pressure imposed on him by the government. This may also be attributed to an intentional plan by Imam Hadi and Imam Askari to train and prepare the Shias for the minor occultation of Imam Mahdi, during which the Shias would not have direct access to their Imam and would have to communicate with him through letters. Ever since Mutawakkil's assassination, the Turks had mostly held power and nothing could stop them from replacing or even killing an Abbasid Caliph. When Musta'in assumed power, he was just a Caliph by title, and real power was held by the Turk leaders. Despite their significant power, the Turk leaders were not always united with each other. During the government of Musta'in, one of the Turk leaders was killed as a result of a power struggle among the Turk leaders. To save himself from the conspiracy of the Turks, Musta'in secretively moved his government from Samarra to Baghdad. His action caused an outrageous reaction by the Turks in Samarra, and they became united against him. They decided to choose Mu'taz, one of Mu'tawakkil's sons, for the caliphate. The Turks released Mu'taz from Musta'in's prison and paid allegiance to him as the new caliph. They then sent their troops towards Baghdad for war with Musta'in's troops and supporters. Over a period of about 10 months, they had multiple battles, which finally ended with Mu'taz's victory and Musta'in's resignation from the caliphate. He was later killed by Mu'taz's order. <music> Mu 
Muhammad was the oldest son of Imam Hadi. He was very pious and had a great character. Many of the Shias thought that he would be the Imam after Imam Hadi because the eldest son often inherited the Imamat. However, around two years before Imam Hadi's martyrdom, his son Muhammad passed away while he was traveling. He fell sick and passed away close to the city of Balad, between Samara and Baghdad. His demise brought great sorrow and grief to his father, Imam Hadi, and to his younger brother, Imam Askari. Imam Hadi would often correct his companion's assumptions about his eldest son, Muhammad, being the next Imam. During his Imamat, he had introduced Imam Askari to his close companions as his successor. After the demise of Muhammad, which took place about two years before Imam Hadi's martyrdom, the Imam had become more explicit in introducing Imam Askari, his eldest son alive, as the next Imam. For example, in the memorial program that Imam Hadi held in his house for his son Muhammad, many attended, including his companions and the elders of Banu Hashim. During this program, Imam Hadi had openly addressed Imam Askari and told him to be thankful to God for his decree upon him. Imam Hadi had implied God's decree of Imam Askari's Imamat after himself. This became more evident for the Shias after the demise of Muhammad. Upon gaining power, Mu'taz followed his father Mutawakkil's policy in dealing with the Alavids. He treated the Alavids harshly. He could not tolerate Imam Hadi's noble character and feared the Imam's social popularity as a threat to his government. Thus, after two years into his caliphate, Mu'taz ordered the poisoning and martyrdom of Imam Hadi. Imam Hadi was martyred in Samara after he had lived there with his family for around 20 years. Imam Askari took care of his father's funeral rites, including washing and praying on his body. When the news of Imam Hadi's martyrdom spread in the city, crowds of people came to the Imam's house to express their sorrow to his family and to participate in his burial. Top government and military officials, including members of the Abbasid royal family, were also among those who came to the Imam's house and expressed their sorrow to Imam Hadi's eldest son, Imam Askari. The people then took the Imam's corpse to the streets of Samara, and a large funeral procession was held for the Imam in the city. Historical records show that Imam Askari had excessive exhaustion during the funeral due to heavy crowds and a high temperature that day. The Imam's body was returned to his house and it was buried on the spot where he used to pray. At the age of 22 years, Imam Askari took on the leadership of the Shia community after his father, Imam Hadi's martyrdom. On various occasions, Imam Hadi had introduced Imam Askari to his companions as his successor in the Imamat. He had informed some that the Imamat would be inherited by his oldest son. After the demise of his oldest son, Muhammad, Imam Hadi had openly announced Imam Askari's Imamat, since he was now his eldest living son. About four months prior to Imam Hadi's martyrdom, he had announced Imam Askari's imamat to a group of his visiting Shias and had asked them to testify to his statement. After Imam Hadi's martyrdom, the Shia scholars and followers readily accepted the imamat of Imam Askari. At that time, Shi'ism was a well-established and growing theology with a strong scientific backbone. Ever since their establishment, the Abbasid Caliphs used whatever means possible to oppose and eradicate Shi'ism. Mansur and Harun's extremely suppressive policy against Imam Sadiq and Imam Qasim, Ma'mun's conspiracies which falsely portrayed a good relationship with Imam Raza and Imam Jawad, and Mutawakkil's intense surveillance and constant harassments of Imam Hadi could not prevent the growth and propagation of the Shia theology among the Muslims. The Shia Imams falsified the conspiracies against themselves, guided the Shias to the true Islamic teachings, and advised them on the political affairs. Due to their efforts, 
about two and a half centuries after the Holy Prophet's demise, Shi'ism had become a strong and growing theology among the Islamic sects, and had many followers across the Islamic territory. The influence of the Shi'as and their leader, Imam Askari, were undeniable and could not have been ignored by any of the Abbasid Caliphs. There was another important reason for the Abbasids to increase their pressure and surveillance on Imam Askari. The Abbasids, like the Shia Imams, were from the Prophet's tribe of Banu Hashim. They had received the news of the Prophet's prophecy about the last Shia Imam, Imam Mahdi, who would establish justice on earth. They feared Imam Mahdi would endanger their government and were actively looking to seek and eliminate him. Imam Askari's circumstances were an opportunity for him to train the Shias for his son, Imam Mahdi's minor occultation, when the Shias would not have direct access to their Imam and would have to communicate with him through writing to him. This is the reason why the majority of Imam Askari's communications with his Shia followers and representatives were through exchanging letters. Thus, Imam Askari became the first Shia Imam who primarily communicated with the Shias by letters rather than meeting them in person. The Imam would respond to their questions in writing and guide them on their religious and political affairs. The Shias found the Imam's answers in accordance with the teachings of the Prophet and the previous Imams. However, it was still difficult for some to connect with the Imam when they could not physically access him. Imam Askari had described his situation by saying that the Shias were not in doubt about the Imamat of any of his forefathers as much as they were in his Imamat. To remove doubts and prove his Imamat, the Imam would often inform his Shias about future events in his letters to them. Many of the Imam's prophecies are recorded in history. The Imam's policy was effective in strengthening the hearts of the Shias and uniting them around his leadership. The historical records suggest that the Imam was relatively under less pressure at the beginning of his Imamat. Mu'taz, who had just martyred Imam Hadi, did not perceive Imam Askari as an imminent threat to his government. During this time, the Imam had a chance to meet some of the Shia representatives and elders in his residence. Some Shias also had the chance to have a short conversation with the Imam outside of his residence when the Imam was commuting. However, soon after, Mu'taz became suspicious of and hostile towards the Imam and changed his policy towards him. During the short caliphate of Mu'taz, which lasted only for a year since Imam Askari's Imamat had begun, Mu'taz imprisoned the Imam. While the Imam was imprisoned, some of the Abbasids came to one of the Turk leaders who had the Imam in his custody and asked him to make the Imam's imprisonment harder on him. The Turk leader responded that he did not know what else he could do to make the prison harder on the Imam. He said that he had appointed two of his most cruel and heartless guards to oversee the Imam, but they had both been influenced by him and were now dedicated believers who had reached elevated statuses through their worship. The Turk leader requested for the guards and asked them about their observations of the Imam. They admitted that in prison, the Imam did nothing except for worshiping God. They said, we observed someone that was constantly fasting during the days and praying during the entire nights. Whenever we looked at the Imam, our body shook and we felt a strange feeling. The Abbasids had not expected such a response from the Imam's guards and they returned disappointed with their plot. During his short government, Mu'taz decided to martyr Imam Askari. He told his doorkeeper to take the Imam towards Kufa and kill him in secrecy. The plot got exposed and the Imam's Shias found out about it. A companion of the Imam contacted him to inform him about Mu'taz's plot. The Imam responded to his concern by writing, You will be relieved from your concern in three days. 
Three days after the Imam's response, the Turks ousted Mu'taz from the Caliphate, and shortly later, Mu'taz was killed, and the Imam's prophecy had come true. Thus, Mu'taz had not gotten the chance to implement his plot against the Imam. The Imam was the true source of divine knowledge in the society. Many people refer to him with their questions about various aspects of the Islamic sciences. 149 names of narrators of the Imam's sayings are recorded in history. Due to the intense surveillance and pressure on the Imam, he could not always meet with his representatives and followers in person. Thus, Imam Askari became the first Shia Imam who primarily communicated with the Shias through letters. Whenever the Shias had a disagreement about any of their Islamic beliefs, they would send a letter to the Imam and ask for his guidance. Tens of letters from the Imam are recorded in history and are still available. These letters contain the Imam's guidance on the false theological beliefs of the time and his answers to the doubts about the Islamic principles, such as monotheism, tawhid, and the Islamic laws such as hajj, fasting, and marriage. There are also multiple general letters from the Imam to his Shia followers. In one of these letters, the Imam recommended his Shias to maintain piety and gave them a list of ethical recommendations for their life and interactions with the other people in the society. In this letter, the Imam asked his Shia followers to be good members of the society and to treat others respectfully. The historical records show that the Imam was in continuous communication with his followers and representatives until his martyrdom. The Imam would respect and pay high regards to the Shia scholars for guiding the people to the true teachings of the Prophet and the Imams, for defending the Shia belief, and for the direct role in spreading Shiism. The Imam wanted to prepare the Shias for the upcoming time when they would have to refer to the Shia scholars for their Islamic affairs. Abdul Azim al Hassani was a Shia scholar who was a descendant of Imam Hassan. Imam Hadi had referred his Shia followers living close to Abdul Azim al Hassani to ask him their questions. Once, a group of the Shias from Ray in Iran visited Imam Askari in Samara and told him that they were returning from visiting Imam Hussein alayhi salam's shrine in Karbala. To their surprise, the Imam told them, if you had visited the tomb of Abdul Azim al Hassani in Ray, it would be like visiting the tomb of Imam Hussein in Karbala. The Imam wanted to remind them of the high status of Abdul Azim al Hassani for his righteousness and for his service to the Imams and the Shia community. Fazl ibn Shahzan was another great Shia scholar at the time of Imam Askari. He was an expert in various Islamic literature, such as Islamic laws and ilm al-kalam, which is the study of Islamic doctrine that involves defending the Islamic principles against doubters. He authored tens of books on various topics such as defending the Shia belief and falsifying the claims of various sects and theologies. The historical records show Fazl ibn Shahzan's high status before Imam Askari, as the Imam had once remembered him by saying, the people of Khorasan are blessed and fortunate for having such a scholar amongst them. Once one of the Shias visited the Imam and showed him one of Fazl ibn Shahzan's books about the daily rituals and asked for the Imam's opinion. The Imam reviewed the book and verified its contents. The Imam then recommended that he and other Shias follow the contents of the book. The Imam also talked highly about Fazl ibn Shahzan and prayed for God's mercy on him because he knew that he had already passed away by that time. When the Imam's Shia returned to Khorasan, he realized that Fazl ibn Shahzan had died around the time when he had met the Imam. He then recognized the Imam's words as a sign of the Imam's knowledge of the unseen.
The Imam was a true source of guidance for the Muslims and was concerned about the deviations in their belief. Ishaq Kendi, a famous Iraqi philosopher, was writing a book about what he had perceived as contradictions in the Quran. He was so committed that he spent most of his time in the house to finish this book. He was using the literal meaning of the Quranic verses and would misinterpret them to falsely prove contradictions between the verses. Once the Imam saw one of Kendi's students and expressed his concern about Kendi's action, the student responded about his own inability and lack of knowledge to confront his teacher. The Imam asked him if he was willing to follow his advice to guide Kendi, and he accepted. The Imam then instructed the student to become close to Kendi, and at an appropriate time, ask him if it is possible that the Qur'an's author might have meant to convey a different meaning than his interpretation. The student followed the Imam's instruction. When Kendi heard his student's advice, he was shocked and found it rationally correct. He then confessed that there could have been other meanings for the Qur'anic verses from what he had interpreted. He asked his student who he had learned his advice from. His student hesitated to answer, but due to Kendi's insistence, he confessed that Imam Askari had been guiding him. Kendi then confessed to the Imam's elevated status and ordered his incomplete book be burned. Mu'taz, like his predecessors, was not able to reduce the Turks' influence upon his government. Once a group of the Turks came to him and asked for their allowance. Mu'taz did not have enough money at the moment to pay them, so he asked his mother for money. Although his mother was wealthy, she refused to pay him anything. The Turks were disappointed by Mu'taz and decided to kill him. They dragged him by his feet, beat him, and kept him barefoot under the sweltering sun. Due to the high temperature of that day, Mu'taz could not keep both of his feet on the ground and switched between them for relief. The Turks did not give him food or water for three days, isolated him, and left him to die. Mu'taz died after his short caliphate of about three and a half years. Before killing Mu'taz, the Turks had selected Mu'tadi, one of Wathiq's sons, and Mu'taz's cousin, as the next caliph. Mu'tadi had been imprisoned by Mu'taz in Baghdad, as Mu'taz had feared for his government. When the Turks decided to remove Mu'taz from the caliphate, they freed Mu'tadi and quickly transported him from Baghdad to Samara. The Turks brought Mu'taz, who was injured from his imprisonment, in the presence of Mu'tadi, and he ousted himself from the caliphate and paid allegiance to Mu'tadi as the new caliph. Upon assuming the caliphate, Muhtadi became concerned about the limited power of the caliph, which he had seen among his predecessors. To stabilize his power and build his social status among the Muslims, he decided to adopt a different ruling strategy from his predecessors. He followed Umar ibn Abdul Aziz's policy, which was fair compared to the other Umayyad caliph strategies. In an attempt to gain social popularity, he adopted a simple lifestyle in his eating, clothing, and expenses. He also banned serving alcohol and holding music parties in the palace and made himself available for the public to fulfill their judicial requests. To meet the needs of the growing Shia community, Imam Sadiq had established a network organization of his trusted companions as his representatives in various cities across the Islamic territory. This organization was further developed during the imamate of the next imams and became an effective way of communication between the Shias and their imam. The organization's representatives were responsible for answering the questions about the Islamic laws and principles, transferring the letters between the imam and his Shias, and resolving any division between the Shias to keep the Shia community united. They were also collecting the Islamic dues, or zakat, and transferring it to the imam, or spending it on situations per his instructions. During Imam Hadi's time, 
His life in the capital of the Abbasids was under intense surveillance by the government. Due to this, the Imam was not always able to manage this secret organization, so he built it into a unique status of managing itself with his limited direct role. This organization was structured hierarchically, where the Imam appointed representatives for each geographical region, and the representatives in turn managed the local representatives of their regions. Imam Askari led this hidden organization and took on its responsibility from the day that Imam Hadi was martyred, in such a way that the Shias and the representatives felt Imam Hadi's presence even after his martyrdom. Imam Askari would respond to the questions raised by the Shias and would guide them for their religious and political affairs. The names of the Imam's 21 representatives are recorded in history. The Imam's leadership led to the expansion of the Shia community and prepared them for Imam Mahdi's occultation when they would not have direct access to their Imam. Due to the intense surveillance and pressures on Imam Askari, there were times when communication with the Imam would endanger the lives of his followers and representatives. During those difficult times, any communication with the Imam was in secret and using undercover methods. Osman ibn Said al-Amri was the Imam's top representative in Samara, who had managed the other representatives in the Imam's network organization. He was often the point of contact for the Imam's representatives who wanted to transfer the collected Islamic dues or letters to the Imam and to get his response. His cover job was as an oil seller, and he would often hide the collected Islamic dues and the letters to the Imam inside the oil containers. He would then send those oil containers to the Imam's house. The Imam would also communicate with Osman ibn Sa'id al-Amri using other secretive means. For example, once the Imam hid some letters inside a hollow, long piece of wood to pass it to Osman. The Imam asked someone who was working inside his house to pass the wood to Osman. That person took the wooden log and left the Imam's house. However, on his way, he was blocked by a mule, and he used the wooden log to hit the animal to clear his way. As a result, the wooden log broke and the hidden letters inside it were exposed. He then took the letters back to the Imam's house. The Imam became upset with him and advised him to be careful and focus his attention on the task given to him. The Imam was sensitive about the occurrence of any monetary or ethical corruption in the organization, because for the Shias, the representatives in the organization represented the Imam. This organization was supposed to serve as a systematic means for managing the Shia community's affairs in the future, when the Shias would not have direct access to their Imam. Any corruption in this organization could cause a great disappointment and division among the Shias. The Imam once confronted and discharged a representative who had crossed the ethical limits. Due to the significant power that the Turks had, the Abbasid government weakened and lost its supreme authority over parts of its territory. There were various uprisings and rebellions against the Abbasids around this time. One of the major uprisings was of the African slaves in southern Iraq, which became known as the uprising of Sahib al-Zanj. The leader of this uprising wrongfully claimed to be an Alavid and was able to gather many followers, especially from the African slaves. His uprising lasted about 14 years and became a serious challenge for the Abbasids. This uprising had many casualties, but was finally suppressed by the Abbasids. When a companion of the Imam wrote to him to ask his opinion about the uprising of Sahib al-Zanj, the Imam rejected any affiliation of the uprising's leader with the Alavids and himself. The Imam did not endorse this uprising, which was led by a liar seeking his own power. The uprising of Sahib al-Zanj continued after the short rule of Muhtadi. When Mu'tamid, the next caliph, assumed power, 
He was also concerned about this uprising and sent his troops under his brother's leadership to suppress it. When the Abbasid troops were leaving Samarra, the Imam accompanied the Caliph and they watched the army leave. The Imam's presence was a public announcement that he condemned the uprising of Sahib al Zanj and the gruesome bloodshed that it had caused. This also helped to decrease Mu'tamid's life-threatening hostilities and conspiracies against the Imam. Although Muhtadi had adopted a fair ruling strategy as compared to his predecessors, his policy against the Imam and his Shia followers remained as hostile as the other Abbasid caliphs. His hostility towards the Imam was to such an extent that he swore by God to exile the Imam and the Alabids from every land on earth where they settled. One of Muhtadi's military leaders, Nasr ibn Ahmad, also accepted to implement his decision against the Imam, but Muhtadi's short government did not allow him to exile or kill the Imam. Around this time, problems in Muhtadi's government intensified and he had to send Nasr ibn Ahmad to a war in which he was killed. In a letter, the Imam had referred to Nasr ibn Ahmad's death as a sign of God's power. Around this time, one of the Imam's companions wrote a letter to him and told him what Muhtadi had sworn against the Imam. He praised God for keeping the Caliph busy in the government affairs so that he was distracted from harassing and killing the Imam. The Imam responded to him by writing, Muhtadi's life is shorter than what you even can imagine. The Imam informed him that Muhtadi would be killed with humiliation in just six days. As the Imam had predicted, Muhtadi was killed six days later and the Imam's prophecy had come true. Despite the problems in Muhtadi's government, he had decided to imprison the Imam just a few days before his death. While in prison, the Imam told his companion who was imprisoned with him that Muhtadi had decided that night to eventually kill the Imam. He repeated his previous prophecy that God had shortened Muhtadi's life and that he would be killed the following day. As the Imam had predicted, Muhtadi was killed by the Turks the next day before getting the opportunity to implement his decision against the Imam. Although Muhtadi followed a different ruling strategy, he could not resolve the main problem in the Abbasid government, which was the amount of power that the Turks had. Despite their power, there was a constant struggle between the Turk leaders for more power and wealth. Thus, Muhtadi decided to tackle this problem by turning the Turk leaders against each other. However, his plot failed and led to their suspicions against him. When Muhtadi imprisoned and killed a Turk leader, his action caused a rebellion within his army in Samarra. This rebellion quickly turned into a massive war between his divided army, and many were killed. His supporters in the army were defeated, and the remaining fled away. Muhtadi found himself lonely and helpless and called the people to come out on Samara's streets to support him as their caliph, but no one came to his aid. He ran to the prison and freed the prisoners, hoping to get their support from him, but the freed prisoners did not support him either. The Turks then arrested the lonely caliph and imprisoned him. They asked him to oust himself from the caliphate, but he refused and told them that he preferred to be killed instead, so the Turk leaders beat him to death. Muhtadi died after short caliphate of only about 11 months. After Muhtadi, the Turks selected Mu'tamid, one of Mutawakkil's sons, as the next caliph. Mu'tamid had been imprisoned by Muhtadi, who had feared him for his government. However, 
When the Turks decided to remove Muhtadi from the Caliphate, they freed Mu'tamid and had selected him as the next Caliph. Due to the excessive competition and disagreements among the Turk leaders during Mu'tamid's government, the Turk leaders decided to have Mu'tamid appoint one of his brothers as the head of the army. Mu'tamid appointed his brother Muwaffaq for this position. Mu'tamid, like the other Abbasid caliphs, indulged in sinful behaviors. His government was practically managed and run by his brother Muwaffaq. Since Mutawakkil's assassination, the Turk leaders had substituted five Abbasid caliphs over the course of a decade. Muwaffaq was able to control the Turks' power and stabilize his brother's government, so Mu'tamid had a long government of about 23 years. By stabilizing his government, Mu'tamid moved his capital to the traditional capital of the Abbasids, Baghdad, and Samara lost its political significance. During his imamat, one of Imam Askari's main concerns was to protect the life of his only child, Imam Mahdi, who would inherit the imamat after him as the last Shia imam. Imam Askari kept Imam Mahdi's birth a secret, even from his close family members. By God's miracle, Imam Mahdi's mother, Narjis Khatun, did not show any sign of an expected mother. This miracle was similar to the miracle of Prophet Moses' mother, who had also not shown any sign of an expecting mother because God had wanted to save Prophet Moses from the Pharaoh. On the night of Imam Mahdi's birth, Imam Askari asked his aunt, Hakime, who was Imam Hadi's sister, to stay at his home and help with Narjis Khatun's delivery. Hakime was shocked as she had not known that Narjis Khatun was expecting. Hours later, at dawn, Imam Mahdi opened his eyes to this world and was born secretively. Even after Imam Mahdi's birth, Imam Askari continued to keep his son's existence a secret. He only showed Imam Mahdi to certain trusted companions. Like his predecessors, Mu'tamid was concerned about the Imam for his government for two main reasons. First, Imam Askari was the leader of the Shias, who did not accept the legitimacy of the Abbasid government. By this time, the Shias were large in number and were widespread in the Abbasid territory. Second, the Abbasids had received the news about the last Shia Imam, Imam Mahdi, who would establish justice on earth. They feared Imam Mahdi for their unjust government. Thus, Mu'tamid, who wanted to closely monitor the Imam, ordered to imprison him. While in prison, the Imam's condition and interaction with some Shia leaders, who were imprisoned with him, remained under surveillance by the government through spy prisoners. The Imam once identified a spy prisoner to the Shia elders, and they confiscated the spy's report to the Caliph. After a while from the Imam's imprisonment, Mu'tamid had to refer to the Imam and free him. A severe drought had hit Samara and Mu'tamid ordered the people to pray for rain. The Muslims prayed for three consecutive days, but it did not rain. On the fourth day, the Christians, including their leaders and monks, went outside the city to pray for rain, and it rained. Large drops of water would fall from the sky every time one of the monks among the Christians raised his hands towards the sky. To the surprise of the Muslims, the Christians repeated their prayer the next day and it rained again. As a result of the Christian prayers, the need for water was fulfilled. This incident caused a serious doubt among the Muslims about their faith and some were even attracted towards Christianity. This unpleasant news forced Mu'tamid, the Muslim's caliph, to act. He ordered to release Imam Askari from the prison and brought him to his presence. He talked to the Imam about what had happened and asked the Imam to save the faith of the nation of his forefather, the Prophet. The Imam told Mu'tamid to ask the people to leave the city for their prayer on the following day. Mu'tamid responded that the people no longer needed water. The Imam replied that his intention was to remove doubts from the hearts of the people. The following day, the Imam and the people went outside the city. The Christians prayed for rain, and when a particular monk raised his hands toward the sky again, it began to rain. The Imam then asked to hold the hands of that monk and bring what he was hiding in his hand. A small bone found between the monk's fingers and was brought to the Imam. 
The Imam then wrapped the bone around a piece of cloth and asked the Christians to pray again for rain. This time when they prayed, it did not rain. Instead, the clouds dispersed and the sky became sunny. The Caliph asked the Imam about the bone and the Imam responded that the bone was a remain of a prophet and that whenever a bone of a prophet is exposed to sky, rain would fall. The Caliph was delighted by the Imam's guidance and freed him with high respects. The Imam then asked for the release of his companions from the prison, which the Caliph accepted. Although the Imam was freed from the prison, the pressure on him continued and his life remained under intense surveillance. This was to the extent that the Imam had to present himself at the Abbasid Palace twice a week, on Mondays and Thursdays, to confirm his presence in Samara. Whenever the Imam wanted to go to the palace, crowds of people who expected his commute would gather in the streets to see him. This shows the Imam's social status and respect in people's hearts, which was obviously one of the reasons for the hostility of the Abbasid Caliphs towards him. The Imam was also respected by the workers inside the Abbasid palace, who would call the Imam by his title of Abba Muhammad or Ibn al-Raza, which conveys respect in Arabic. Only certain people in the palace were called by their titles, such as the Caliph and his crown prince. The Imam's Shia followers were also among the crowd who would wait to see him on the streets of Samara. The Imam was concerned about his Shias being identified in the crowd, which would endanger their lives. If they ever wanted to approach the Imam and initiate a conversation with him in unsafe circumstances, the Imam would hint to them to remain silent. On one occasion, the Imam sent a letter to his Shias who were in Samara and intended to meet him. In the letter, the Imam warned them about risking their lives by visiting him. In another letter, the Imam asked his Shia followers not to wear their rings in their right hands, as the Shias were known in the society for always wearing the rings in their right hands. Through his advice, the Imam wanted his Shia followers not to be identified and hence to protect their lives. On another occasion, Mu'tamid imprisoned the Imam and his brother Ja'far. Mu'tamid would frequently inquire about the Imam's condition in custody. The Imam's guard would report that the Imam spent the days fasting and the nights in prayer. After a while, Mu'tamid saw the Imam's guard again and repeated his inquiry and heard the same response. He then ordered the guard to go to the prison right away and pass his greetings to the Imam and release him from the prison. When the guard went to the prison, he observed that the Imam had already prepared for his release by wearing his formal clothing. After being released, the Imam did not leave. Instead, he told the guard that he had entered the prison with his brother and should leave the prison with him. That person transferred the Imam's words to Mu'tamid, who then ordered the release of the Imam's brother as well. When the Imam was released from the prison, he described his situation in a letter by referring to the following verse of the Qur'an. They want to extinguish God's light with their mouths, but God will complete His light even though the disbelievers dislike it. By referring to this verse, the Imam revealed the real intention of the government, which was to kill him before he would have any children to inherit the Imamat from him. 
The Imam emphasized God's absolute will about the 12th Imam, which would be manifested with certainty. Muhammad had known that killing the Imam in the prison would endanger his government as he would be blamed. Thus, he released the Imam from the prison and within a month ordered for the Imam's poisoning. He wanted to eliminate the Imam before the Imam could have any offspring to inherit the Imam from him. Even though Mu'tamid had secretly poisoned the Imam to eliminate him, he was afraid that his plot would be revealed. When the Imam was on his deathbed, Mu'tamid isolated him from his followers and the outside world. He also wanted to use this isolation to portray to the public that the Imam's condition mattered to him. When the news of the Imam's illness was brought to Mu'tamid, he ordered five of his trusted close ones to stay in the Imam's house and continuously report the Imam's condition. He also ordered a physician to visit the Imam twice a day and closely monitor the Imam's condition. Two days later, the Imam's illness worsened and his body weakened. When Mu'tamid's minister was informed about this, he personally visited the Imam and ordered the physicians not to leave the Imam. He also ordered 10 known scholars to stay with the Imam. They all closely monitored the Imam's condition until his martyr. After about eight days of illness, the Imam's soul ascended on the 8th of Rabi al-Awwal in the year 260 Hijri in Samara at the age of 27. He was martyred after a short imamat of less than six years. Thus, Imam Askari had the shortest duration of imamat compared to the other Shia Imams. The historical records show Imam Mahdi's presence by his father's deathbed before his father's martyrdom. By God's decree, his presence was miraculously not observed by the government agents who were monitoring the Imam. When Mu'tamid was informed about the Imam's martyrdom, he sent his agents to search the Imam's entire house for any trace of a possible heir. He also sent female agents to inspect the women in the Imam's house to inquire if any of them were expecting. There was a suspicion about one female worker in the Imam's house who seemed like she might be expecting. Mu'tamid then instructed his trusted servant to keep her isolated to validate the suspicion. She was kept isolated for about two years but did not show any sign of pregnancy. After the Imam's close companions and family members had prepared to pray before the Imam's body, the Imam's brother Ja'far stepped forward to lead the prayer. Imam Mahdi, who was less than four years old, approached Ja'far. He pulled Ja'far's cloak and told him, O oh, uncle, step back as I am more deserving than you to lead the prayer on my father. Ja'far, who didn't expect to be stopped by a child, was shocked and moved back unintentionally. Imam Mahdi then led the prayer on his father's body and disappeared quickly after. When the news of the Imam's martyrdom spread in the city, crowds of people came to the Imam's funeral, including the top government officials. 
Mu'tamid, who wanted to portray his innocence regarding the Imam's martyrdom, appointed his brother, Abu Isa, to officially perform the prayer on the Imam's body. Before praying, Abu Isa showed the Imam's face to the elders, scholars, and officials, and asked them to witness that the Imam had died by a natural death. He also told them that some of the trusted scholars and physicians were surrounding the Imam during his illness and can testify to the Imam's natural death. After the prayer and the funeral procession, the Imam's body was carried towards the tomb of his father, Imam Hadi, and was buried by his side. Imam Hassan al-Askari's short imamat coincided with the governments of three Abbasid caliphs. His imamat started with the martyrdom of his father, Imam Hadi, during the Caliphate of Mu'taz. Although the Caliphate of Mu'taz lasted for only a year after the beginning of Imam Askari's imamat, Mu'taz could not tolerate the imam and had imprisoned him. While the imam was in the prison, the Abbasids demanded more pressure and harassment upon the imam. Their plot was ineffective because the Imam's guards were influenced by his divinely character and continual prayers. Later, Mu'taz decided to even kill the Imam, but due to his sudden murder by the Turks, his plot had failed. Imam Askari's Imamat continued during the short Caliphate of Muhtadi, who adopted a fair ruling strategy as compared to the other Abbasid Caliphs in an attempt to gather social popularity and stabilize his own government. However, Muhtadi followed the other Abbasid Caliphs in confronting and harassing the Imam. He had sworn by God to exile the Imam and the Alavids from every land on earth where they settled. He also imprisoned the Imam and even decided to kill him. However, the complications in his government and his sudden murder by the Turks did not allow him to implement his plot against the Imam. The Imamat of Imam Askari continued to the Caliphate of Mu'tamid, who followed the policy of his predecessors in confronting and harassing the Imam. He imprisoned the Imam and put pressures on him and monitored his activities. Mu'tamid could not tolerate the Imam and finally ordered the Imam's poisoning, which led to the Imam's martyrdom. The Imam was martyred at a very young age, a month before turning 28 years old. Imam Askari was the second youngest Shia Imam when he was martyred after Imam Jawad, who was martyred at the age of 25. Imam Askari also had the shortest duration of Imamat among the Shia Imams, which lasted for less than six years. The Imam during his short Imamat was the source of guidance for all of the Muslims. The Imam had defended the Islamic beliefs against the Christians by revealing their secret when they had prayed for rain. He guided Ishaq Kendi, an Iraqi philosopher, and stopped him from writing a book against the Qur'an, which could have misled many of the Muslims. The Imam was the sole religious and political leader for the Shias. Due to the intense surveillance and pressures on the Imam, he could not always meet with his representatives and followers in person. Thus, the majority of their communications were through exchanging letters. The Imam responded to questions in writing and would guide the people about the religious and political affairs. The Imam's communications with his followers continued until the last day of his life. The most unique aspect of the Imamat of Imam Askari was his efforts to protect the life of his son, Imam Mahdi, and his preparation of the Shias for Imam Mahdi's occultation. Imam Askari kept the birth of Imam Mahdi a secret, even from his family members. Even after his son's birth, the Imam only showed him to certain members of his family and most trusted close companions. The Abbasids, who had received the news of the last Shia Imam, were afraid of his justice for their government. They put Imam Askari's life under intense surveillance, the Imam was imprisoned multiple times by every Abbasid Caliph who ruled during his Imamat, and he was finally martyred after his brief period of leadership. Imam Askari's circumstances were an opportunity for him to train the Shias for the minor occultation of his son, Imam Mahdi, when the Shias would not have direct access to their Imam and would need to communicate with him in writing. Therefore, majority of Imam Askari's communications with his Shia followers and representatives were through exchanging letters. The Imam respected and highly regarded the Shia scholars because they guided the people to the true teachings of the Prophet and the Imams. 
with his respect, the Imam wanted to prepare the Shias for the upcoming time when they would have to refer to the Shia scholars for their Islamic queries. The Imam also expanded the network organization of his representatives as a systematic means of managing the Shia community's affairs. The Imam trained this organization to be managed without his direct role. Overall, the Shias are in debt to Imam Askari for his efforts to protect the life of Imam Mahdi and to prepare them for Imam Mahdi's lengthy occultation.